So, welcome to the listening session for the Governor's Commission on the Future of Transportation. This is the, the second listening session in the series of five. A uh, little bit of context about the game plan for this afternoon. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll start off with a little bit about, about the Commission's work, their activities, and we're, we're thrilled to have the Vice Chair of the Commission here with us today uh, to set the stage for, for what the Commission's up to. We'll show a short little video introducing their work. And then to provide some, some context for today's theme, which is electrification, we have uh, two panelists that will that'll offer some brief remarks uh, about the future of transportation with respect to uh, electrification. Uh, after that time, we'll allow the commission members to engage with the panelists, ask a couple of questions, offer any insights, and then uh, what everybody's most probably excited for is the, the, the public input session. We'll turn it over and, uh, and open it up to all of you to, to offer comments uh, that you'd like to share with the commission. So uh, just to get us rolling here, we'll start with the short little video that the commission has put together. Transportation in the Commonwealth is not important for what it is, but rather for what it does, gets people where they need to go, and shapes the economy of communities. But transportation as we know it is changing through advancements in technology like ride-sharing programs and autonomous vehicles, shifts in the state's demographics with an aging population, and changes in the environment with more frequent major weather events. Earlier this year, I issued an executive order establishing the Commission on the Future of Transportation in the Commonwealth to address these and other challenges that Massachusetts may face in the future. This diverse team of 19 cross-sector leaders will help us better develop policy and make informed transportation decisions based on how changes in technology, climate, land use, and our economy will affect transportation patterns and the needs of constituents. The governor has asked this commission to do something that is very unusual for state government. It's to look 20 years in the future. It's not looking at today, it's not looking at a year from now, three years from now, five years from now. Five years from now for most of state government is a long time away. We're doing something that is uh, very unusual and to think about what the world might be 20 years from now. It's a fascinating time in transportation. Technology is changing, the demographics of the people we serve are changing, our climate is even changing, and the Commission can really help MassDOT and the MBTA understand how to account for all those changes as we operate our services and as we make investments for the future. The work of the Transportation Commission will be hugely influential on the future work of energy and environmental affairs because currently transportation accounts for up to 40 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions across the Commonwealth. As we transition into a more electrified uh, transportation fleet, this will be hugely helpful in us trying to meet the terms of our carbon reduction goals. The work will also help us to make the transportation network, the physical structures that exist today, be more resilient and more adapted to the forces of a changing climate. So I think that transportation is really the cornerstone to our economy. You know, we have to move people, we have to move goods, we have to just make sure the economy thrives and, and, and transportation is so critical to that. To me, the most exciting element of the Commission's work is the fact that we can look to the future and aspire to the transportation system that we all want. I look forward to working with all of you as we build a stronger, better, forward-looking transportation system here in Massachusetts. Share your thoughts and suggestions, and learn about our public engagement sessions at mass.gov slash future of transportation. Short introduction. Now, um, now I'm going to introduce the, the vice chair of the commission, uh, Ms. Eileen McEnany, is the president of the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation. Uh, she's going to offer insight into the, the work of the commission uh, specifically in today's session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for attending this really important event. Um, this is an important effort 
to understand how disruptive changes in technology and climate and demographics and more will impact our transportation system in the Commonwealth. Um, I do want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank the University of Massachusetts Transportation Center and Clark University for hosting. Um, I don't see any elected officials in the room at this time, but certainly if I missed anyone, I want to give um, anyone elected here an opportunity to stand and be recognized. No, so we may have some folks joining us um, later in the program, and we'll welcome their presence. So the governor and the lieutenant governor, I mean my classes here, created this commission to help advise them and other decision makers on how Massachusetts can best prepare for some of the monumental changes that we're facing. The commission is comprised of 19 members, um, people with lots of different areas of expertise representing different parts of the state and with different viewpoints. So we've had very robust discussions to date. We've also um, separated the group into five working groups so that we can tackle a lot of the subtopics involved in this. And today, the focus of this hearing is on the electrification of transportation, although I would certainly say if you want to offer more general <laughs> comments, you're welcome to do that. I do need to just tell you what the commission is not. It is not a project specific commission, so we're not taking feedback on particular projects at this time. It's also not a revenue commission in the sense um, that we're looking for new sources of revenue, although certainly in our work we are recognizing that there will be need for investment and, and, and we're factoring in the cost of things, but it isn't a revenue commission per se. Um, so with that, I, I would like for you to, to um, introduce the speakers that we have. Just to set the agenda, we will hear from a couple of speakers from the University of Massachusetts Transportation Center. Then we will open it up for public comments and can talk a little bit more about that as we engage in that part of the agenda. All right, and as mentioned, the panelists today are here to provide a little bit of context uh, for the, the specifics of the session. And so we've asked them to do something that is uh, usually pretty challenging for academics. We've asked them to keep their remarks under 10 minutes and no PowerPoint. So, uh, but uh, I'm sure they'll be able to do that uh, here for us today. So our, our first panelist today uh, is Professor Eleni Kristofa. Uh, she's a, a professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department uh, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her area of expertise is in traffic signal and operations, and, and more recently she started doing lots of work with respect to sustainability uh, and multimodal transportation. Uh, last year, I should just note, she was recognized by the Transportation Research Board as the outstanding younger member of that organization. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Eleni Persofa. Could I go, I'm just, uh, I was remiss. I, 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 my apologies, but I do want to introduce my co-commissioners who are here with me. So um, to my left, Tim McGurgy, who's with the Worcester uh, Research Bureau, Dan Dolan, who's with the New England Power Generators Association, um, Karen sawyer Kennard, who is with the Merrimack, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. Planning Commission. Um, so with that, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, for the introduction. Um, so I was asked to talk to you today about a little bit about electric electrification as it uh, relates to transit. Um, and as you might know, uh, electrification in transit is not something new. Uh, since the late 1800s, we had streetcars um, all over uh, cities, um, which unfortunately during the Great Depression and World War II, um, when we moved into a motorization phase, they started being dismantled. Um, later on, some cities took advantage of the electrified routes and they used them for uh, trolley buses that they were seen as more flexible. Uh, and uh, more recently, light rail systems uh, have been seen as the renaissance of electrification of transit. Um, however, all these systems require heavy infrastructure um, that needs to be maintained along the route. So uh, the change that we're seeing uh, developing these past few decades is a shift to batteries as the power source, uh, where the energy is not dependent, dependent on infrastructure that you need to have along the route. So these vehicles essentially can move anywhere. Um, and when we talk about electrification of transit now, we're often referred to buses whose propulsion and auxiliary systems are powered by uh, using electric power. 
battery electric buses are the most mature and common technology we see uh, being implemented being implemented by different transit agencies and uh, we've seen some of those implementations in the US since the early 1990s. Um, so overall there are four types of uh, bus technologies that um, fall under the category of electric buses. The battery electric buses, the hybrid diesel electric buses, uh, fuel cell battery electric buses and fuel cell plug-in battery um, electric buses, hybrid electric buses, excuse me. Um, so hybrid diesel um, have both uh, a combustion engine and a battery. Um, fuel cell, uh, excuse me, an electric propulsion system. Fuel cell battery electric buses are uh, usually electricity produced by fuel cells to charge the battery that they have on board. And the, plug, the fuel cell plug-in ones are a hybrid version of, of that in that they can also charge the battery um, while they're at the depot. Um, more and more transit agencies have recognized recently the need um, to implement uh, such types of zero emission or reduced emission buses. And they've started to incorporate them in the fleets a lot of times motivated by mandates um, by the states to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions um, and other times by uh, grants offered by the states and the federal government for such types of technologies. Um, the two technologies that I see being um, compete, competing um, currently are the fuel cell battery electric and battery electric buses. Um, and the question is, how much infrastructure is needed for each of those and how much it would cost uh, to implement each of those technologies, especially for large, large fleet, uh, for implementations for large fleets. Um, in Massachusetts, there are four transit agencies that have implemented um, fuel cell uh, buses or battery electric buses. Um, Worcester, the, one, the local one here, um, Worcester Regional Transit Authority operates six battery electric buses, PVTA, um, in, in the Pioneer Valley, in Springfield, operates three battery electric buses. Um, MBTA operates one fuel cell uh, bus, and um, they're actually in the process of procuring another five battery electric buses, so they changed the type of technology um, they're going with. And Martha's Vineyard um, is in the process of procuring six buses, and their ultimate goal is to make their whole fleet um, just electric. In terms of benefit, electric buses are quieter and emit fewer local emissions. There's always a particular matter from break and tire wear that you cannot get rid of even with those buses. Um, and in the case that the electricity is sourced from renewable um, energy sources, uh, then the reduction in air pollution is substantial. Uh, if electricity is sourced from coal, um, then the air pollution is not, uh, impact is not better than diesel, except that the emissions could be moved to where um, the production of um, coal uh, is done, um, so where fewer people are um, exposed. Uh, maintenance costs are generally expected to be lower for battery, bus, uh, battery electric buses um, because there are fewer moving parts. And in terms of challenges, so far, the main challenge um, agencies had with these types of buses was the range. Um, however, so they had limited ranges of 50 to 100 miles that were not always uh, sufficient for them uh, to be implemented on the longer routes they uh, were operating at. Um, and this was leading to challenges in coordinating the charging infrastructure, the scheduling of the buses, the design of the routes they wanted to uh, implement. Um, so newer models have uh, much higher ranges. Um, I was checking one of the manufacturer's website this morning and they were claiming they have a newer version of a, bat of a battery electric bus that goes up to 426 miles. Um, so that's sufficient for most routes that um, transit agencies are operate, operating. Um, and another claim was that one of the manufacturers achieved a trip of 1,000 miles on a single charge recently. Um, again, those depend on the conditions, the types of the routes, um, so there's a lot of factors that play, come into play. Uh, for fuel cell buses, a big issue is safety concerns. And permits are required for when you're going to implement those buses through certain through neighborhoods, so you need to have approvals. Um, a, a top, an issue that's very relevant for our state is cold weather. Um, these buses tend to have shorter ranges than the ones uh, reported um, because of cold weather, uh, so the batteries don't last as long. And also, uh, sometimes they have issues with startup times being longer than conventional buses. Um, so a lot of times they need to be stored indoors um, uh, at night to make sure that they're not uh, out in the cold weather. And as with all electric vehicles, 
um, and maybe Amro will speak more about that. Um, there are concerns about the life cycle and handling of battery disposal, uh, which would contribute to e-waste. Um, other issues we should consider are electricity and charging infrastructure. A big issue with electric vehicles, especially the ones operating uh, with rechargeable batteries, are that rates can be high and also highly dependable on the time of day. Um, so the type of charts on route versus at the depot can affect the operating cost of the buses. Um, and from um, a study recently completed, one of the common uh, comments was that active partnerships with electric uh, com electricity companies are required to make sure that the cost um, remains at low levels. Um, also, more, de more developments of renewables could be beneficial um, and would assist with reducing pollution from electricity production. Um, investments of offshore and other renewables when combined with electric vehicles could be um, beneficial for reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transportation and specifically from transit operations. Uh, in terms of fa charging facilities, the location needs to be cons of those facilities need to be considered very carefully. Um, and it's highly correlated with the type of vehicle you're operating, the, the specific bus technology, um, the type of charging infrastructure you have in place or you plan to have in place, um, how long it takes to charge those vehicles, um, as well as the uh, route characteristics. So charging times can vary widely depending on whether um, they're slow overnight or fast on route charging. And it could vary for fast, it would be something between 5 and 10 minutes. Uh, for a certain level of charge, and for slow, it could be up to four or five hours, and those are usually tend to tend to happen overnight. So all these are factors that we need to consider when we're designing, um, deciding the type of technology and designing our transit routes um, with electric uh, buses. Uh, looking into the future, um, the cost projections uh, seem to be advantageous for electric buses. Um, procurement costs of battery electric buses specifically are decreasing and expected to reach the same levels as um, hybrid diesel electric buses by 2030. Um, those are estimates made by, um, by CARB in California. Uh, the process is obviously assisted by economies of scale and competition with more and more bus manufacturers coming into the market and selling more battery electric buses. Um, and some barriers include the charging infrastructure needed from a cost and space um, standpoint, a properly trained workforce to be able to operate and maintain these types of buses, and electricity cost and green demand impacts. Um, and I would like to leave you with a question. Um, what are the important considerations of the implementation of such technologies um, at a large scale? Um, so before converting a big part of our transit fleets, what are the issues that we need to be considering? Um, I have a few suggestions. Um, so space and cost needed for recharging infrastructure, um, cost of training of the workforce, um, transit route planning, life cycle costs and emissions of batteries and uh, the contribution of these buses uh, to e-waste, um, and also the advantages and disadvantages of, the, of each of these past technologies that need to be considered before deciding which specific one to implement um, at certain routes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Christopha. And uh, Eleni actually alluded to the increasing prevalence of electric buses here in the Commonwealth. Uh, in fact, happy to invite everybody uh, outside afterwards. Uh, the Worcester RTA was generous enough to deliver an electric bus, park it outside so that anybody that wanted to could go and check that out um, after the listening session. It'd be just straight out the door and then out on, out on uh, Maywood Street. So we're, we're appreciative of that and hope everybody uh, would, would want to check that out if they're so inclined. So it gives me a great privilege to introduce our next panelist today, um, who traveled a little bit to be here. Uh, professor Emro Farid is an associate professor of engineering at the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth uh, College in New Hampshire. So thank you for, for traveling down to be here with us today. Uh, he's also an associate professor of computer science in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, and as it, relevant to today's conversation, uh, he leads the lab for intelligent integrated networks of engineering systems or lines, and I would encourage everybody to check out the blog. Um, I think you'll find it highly uh, relatable to today's topic. And with that, uh, Professor Free. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for the gracious introduction. Uh, so we've been working uh, within my lab on uh, electric vehicle integration studies for some time, and, uh, and what these studies do is really try and have a holistic analysis of 
uh, what happens when you bring in certain penetrations of electric vehicles um, from certainly a cost perspective, but also in terms of the behavior of the transportation system as a whole and the, tra and the behavior of the electric power system as a whole as well. And that all of these things are actually very much integrated. And, and so, you know, I'll, I'll start with the end in mind by, by saying that when we start to think about a large scale integration of electric vehicles, we really need to be thinking about coordinated and evidence-based planning. Uh, and policy and decision making uh, for both transportation agencies as well as electric grid agencies. And it turns out that if you don't get the coordination uh, between those two agencies that are two groups of stakeholders that um, don't normally talk, then, then you can actually have um, very uh, negative effects. But at the same time, if they do talk and coordinate, then you can actually get to synergies that, you, that are far better than what you see today. And that's really because an electric vehicle is both a transportation artifact and an electrical artifact. So you know, when, when I talk to my electrical engineering friends, they, uh, they oftentimes see it as a battery with wheels attached, right? And, um, and they're like, ooh, when I hook it up to the grid, I can do all these like new interesting things, particularly in the context of renewable energy integration and, and so forth. And then when I talk to my transportation colleagues, none at UMass, of course, but um, it, they, they might view it as a, a vehicle with this big, huge like cable, you know, out the back, kind of like a mouse, right? Um, and, and that represents the range of this electric vehicle and the range of anxiety that a lot of people uh, think of when they look at electric vehicles. And, and so really what you need to think about is that this dual nature of the electric vehicle ha leads to all sorts of coupled decisions for um, an electric vehicle driver. They might start to think about where do I go with my electric vehicle? Maybe today I'm not gonna use my electric vehicle, today I might use my conventional vehicle, and they might change the way they go about um, moving from place to pay place. Um, or they might change the routes that they, they take and say, oh well, you know, if I need to get from Los Angeles to San Francisco and there are these Tesla charging stations along, you know, the Pacific Road Highway or maybe they're not on the other highway, I might change the way I go. Um, you might also think about, well, now I can't just park anywhere because there are certain parking uh, lots that have charging stations. Maybe they're close to my business, close to the restaurant, maybe not. And so you have to start thinking about that. And then once your car is there, you say, well, Am I going to charge it right there and then? Or is that what everybody is going to do? Or am I going to charge it a little bit later? Or can there maybe even be a valet that helps me charge it? Or maybe it's a connected vehicle that you know, I can schedule when it will charge. And then finally, once it's finally charging, we can do all sorts of like back-end vehicle-to-grid stabilization and bring about benefits to our electric power grid, making it much more resilient and, um, and reliable and also uh, economically efficient. So really, you know, the, the story is that there's a lot of potential benefits to uh, electric vehicles. Certainly CO2 reduction is one of them. Uh, you know, you are displacing the emissions from conventional vehicles, but it actually it turns out that when you charge electric vehicles, you can actually make the grid as a whole much more efficient. And so, yes, in the worst case of, you know, if you're charging from coal, and we don't really have very much coal here in New England, then you can have higher emissions. But it can actually cause the, the grid as a whole to operate at much more efficient points. And actually, you can have negative emissions as, by virtue of charging. You can also save electricity costs. So a lot of uh, utilities these days are, are concerned about how our electricity consumption is actually going down. And so they want to you know, try to encourage decarbonization and electrification. And, uh, and so that brings a benefit for uh, for electricity rate payers in that the investments that utilities make get spread about across a much larger electricity demand energy-wise. Uh, the electric vehicles can also stabilize uh, uh, the grid in, in all sorts of different ways, particularly when you start thinking about coordinated charging um, or you know, potentially you know, providing what's called frequency stability and, um, and balancing uh, the grid. And then finally, you know, the electric vehicles can help change uh, traffic patterns by virtue of maybe where you put your charging stations, maybe by um, 
by virtue of you know things like HOV lanes being you know favored for electric vehicles, as has been done with hybrid vehicles in the, uh, in the past. And this can only be augmented further as we start to think about um, uh, connected vehicles and ride sharing uh, as two other sort of big thrusts that are affecting uh, transportation. And all of this really to get it right requires that uh, coordinated integrated analysis and bringing about stakeholders from both the energy side as well as the transportation side. And so that's the very positive bright picture. On the, on the, the, the dark picture you can say, well, okay, I can have CO2 emissions because maybe everybody's going to come back home and charge exactly when you know they're also turning on their stoves and doing the you know the peak demand that we see at around six o'clock and um, and if you were to add all of that electric vehicle charging during those times then certainly co2 emissions could potentially go up um, there's also a potential to overbuild charging infrastructure you need to uh, know where and when and how big these charging stations are so that you can think about very carefully the, effectively the capacity planning of, of, uh, of charging. And that's not exactly an easy uh, question. We can also think about, well, destabilizing the grid. Again, like if everyone comes home and charges, um, you know, uh, it becomes all of a sudden popular to have Teslas or whatever. You know, they all come home at six o'clock from their from their jobs, and they all charge at the same time. Well, was that local substation or transformer set up for that? And and maybe it wasn't. And uh, and so you you need to be thinking about upgrading the the grid potentially. And then there's also the issue of charging queues. So um, you know we don't often think about it, but you know, uh, long ago we had, you know, gas shortages and, and there were gas lines uh, for uh, you know, when people were trying to get gas maybe in the 1973 oil prices. But if you think that it takes a long time to charge and that maybe the charging infrastructure has not been well, well planned, then you can actually find queues developing for um, people waiting, waiting to charge. And so that means that you really have to think very carefully about uh, how to prevent those types of uh, types of situations, and and a lot of these decisions really have not been very well developed and studied, and and, and of course, as an academic, I'm going to advocate you know new uh, decision making approaches to to get it right for so that we can get these synergistic uh, benefits. In fact, I uh, tend to call it intelligent transportation energy systems. That, you know, we've been talking about intelligent transportation systems for a long time in the transportation uh, world, but now we need to really bring the energy aspect into, uh, uh, into that type of uh, thinking. And it's really all about providing the right information to uh, electric vehicle owners, whether it's in the private sector or it's in the public sector or fleets or so forth, providing the right information, providing the right, uh, at the right time, providing the right incentives potentially, so that we could again come back to this uh, idea of having coordinated evidence-based planning and uh, policy, make, uh, policy and decision making. So that, you know, that would include the DOTs of the world, the electric utilities of, uh, of the world, our independent grid operators, amongst so many, uh, so many others, because transportation and energy really affect our lives very intimately. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to open it up to commissioners if they have any follow-up questions. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, this may be an unfair question, but I'll try it anyway. But, um, if you were helping guide us in, in making recommendations, what's your prediction? What's the thing that you want to make sure we include um, in our recommendations that will be upon us in 20 years that we may or may not know about now? I'll go first. Um, so I think infrastructure would be the biggest. Finding um, funding and space for new infrastructure that these vehicles will require, whether it's um, along the highway for you know, personal vehicles or at the transit um, depots to charge the transit vehicles overnight. Um, I think that would be an important one. That will probably define also the type of technology you want to be using and the extent to which you can uh, incorporate these types of vehicles in 
in the state fleets or uh, accommodate the personal vehicles that uh, residents of the state have. Yeah, so it's clear to me that electrification is going to happen. And uh, what my big concern is that we, we get it right so that it really does bring about the, uh, the, the benefits for, for everyone. And so, you know, from a planning perspective, getting the infrastructure right and, um, and, and, and making sure that it's fit for purpose. And then from sort of a behavior and operations uh, perspective, you know, make sure that it helps bring about uh, reduced con congestion and um, and a much more resilient uh, power grid because it's not a small part of the grid. It's going to be a very large, you know, maybe up to about 50% of, of, uh, of energy consumption of the grid. So um, getting those two things to work together is going to be very important. Other questions? So I have one, and I'm just wondering if there are jurisdictions either within the United States or globally that you would point to that could, we could look to for you know, further ahead with, with some of this as, as we try to think about it, if there are jurisdictions you can point to. Uh, certainly, I think California has done a lot of great work. <laughs> uh, most of us within the country here look at uh, uh, Look at California, that their Air Resources Board, and and, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, I can probably get back to you with. Uh, I ha I have a uh, several documents of that have reviewed sort of policy measures for its transportation electrification, um, uh, really across the world. We we did survey that. I can't speak off the top of my head, but um, if you give me your email, I'm I'm happy to uh, provide you that information as well. It would be very helpful. Thanks. Any other follow-up questions? And I was going to say, in terms of transit agencies, I was also going to say California. So a few specific ones is are, are of Foothill Transit in Southern California, AC Transit in the Bay Area. Um, I think Antelope is also <coughs> in the southern part of the state. Uh, but I can also provide more uh, once I get the chance to go back and look at which ones have been having the biggest fleets, basically, currently. could provide some insight. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, we're going, to tran we're going to transition now to the public speaking portion. I do want to go over some um, housekeeping rules, but before I do that, I also want to welcome Representative Dykeman from Holliston. Could you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. Would you like to say any more extensive remarks, or are you good? No, I'm just here listening. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you. So we um, we will begin the public speaking session, and, and I do want to just ask uh, folks to be respectful of everyone's time and um, certainly of their point of view. Uh, in, in order to make sure everyone has ample time to speak, we are asking that you limit your remarks to about three minutes. Um, and if there's time at the end, we certainly can engage in more extensive conversation. Um, we're also taking notes, so if you're wondering, you know, if the other 15 commission members will have access to your comments, they certainly will. This is being recorded, and there will be notes, so they'll be shared with the full commission. Um, we also, I just want to remind you again, that the focus is the electrification of transportation, so we're, we're very much interested in remarks with respect to that topic, but certainly if there are other things you want to raise, um, you're welcome to do that. And when you signed in, you were given a number, so we will hear testimony in order of sign-in, so we'll go in order. If there are people who want to speak who didn't indicate that they want to do that, we'll have time at the end in, in case you want to reconsider or change your mind. Okay, so um, with that, we're taking testimony from Public speaker number one. Someone have the number one? Number 10. Oh, they started at number 10. My apologies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick question to see if you were all awake. Okay, so public speaker number 10, please. Thank you. Um, 
Good afternoon, my name is Gina Fogland-Newfield. I direct the National Clean Transportation for All campaign at the Sierra Club, the nation's oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization with more than three million members and supporters. I'm also a resident of Cambridge and a member of the Massachusetts Zero Emission Vehicle Commission convened by Governor Baker's office and a happy EV driver myself. Uh, thank you very much for hosting this session on this important topic. If we were to have any shot at staving off the worst of climate change, it must include a rapid switch to electrification of our cars, trucks, and buses. And this rapid switch will require big, bold, and smart policies. Even factoring in the emissions from the electricity used to power today's EVs, they're significantly cleaner than conventional vehicles. As we shift to renewable sources of power, EVs become eventually truly zero emission. In my brief remarks, I'll underscore um, three main areas. Um, so number one, making EVs less expensive. There are several medium range cost EVs on the market. I drive one of them. Um, but cost is still a challenge for many individuals, businesses, and municipalities. Rebates, like through the state's more EV program, and grants, like through its EVIP program, are important and effective incentives. We need to secure larger and longer term sources of funding for these programs. One way to do this will be through a region-wide program that puts a cap on carbon in the transportation sector and then invest resources in clean transportation programs. We hope Governor Baker will continue his leadership on that effort with governors throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Additionally, we hope the state will soon expand its EV rebate geared toward low-income residents. Other states, such as California and Oregon, have done so, and we think this will be an important way to expand access to cleaner driving. Number two, accelerating electric bus adoption, as you discussed. Diesel buses burn approximately 40 toxic contaminants, contributing to dangerous air pollution that disproportionately impacts low-income residents and communities of color. Electric buses are clean, quiet, and safe. Transit agencies in cities like Los Angeles have committed to an all-electric transit bus fleet by 2030. Massachusetts transit agencies in Worcester, Springfield, and Martha's Vineyard have made modest investments in electric buses, but we need much faster and bolder commitments in order to meet our climate and air quality goals. The VW Senate will help with that. And number three, improving our building codes to be EV ready. This summer, we expect the Massachusetts Board of Building Regulation and Standards to take the next step in evaluating whether to adopt EV-ready building codes. We very much hope that BBRS will take this wise future-proofing step. Indeed, it will be following in the footsteps of other cities and states that are requiring new homes and buildings and parking structures to be EV-ready, having the conduit and wiring in place to accommodate EV charging. Uh, studies show that installing EV-friendly wiring at the time of construction can be 64 to 75% less expensive than post-construction installations. California and Washington State have put in place statewide EV-ready codes. Atlanta passed a city ordinance recently that will require 20% of all the spaces in new commercial and multi-unit family parking structures to be EV-ready and requires all new development of residential homes to be equipped with EV-ready wiring. San Francisco passed a similar ordinance to avoid these future costs. Thank you so much for your attention to this critical topic of vehicle electrification. Thank you. Any follow-up questions? No. I would ask uh, public speaker at number 11. Hi, thank you very much for uh, hosting this session. Uh, my name is Mark Lavelle, I'm the staff attorney for Acadia Center. We are a nonprofit uh, clean energy advocacy organization. Uh, I'm a member of the Massachusetts Zero Emission Vehicle Commission, and I've been working on these issues for a number of years, so glad to, to see so much excitement and attention around these issues. Uh, so there's a lot that we can do to advance electric vehicles, both in the short term and in, in the long term. We want to see better, more affordable electric vehicles, we're going to see more accessible, consumer-friendly charging stations. We need to see consumer uh, education and outreach 
Um, there are a lot of important uh, long-range goals in these areas that the, the Future Transformation Commission could, could uh, hopefully address. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Fareed for addressing some of the utility and regulatory issues uh, so eloquently earlier. Um, we need to continue to, to clean the electric grid and integrate electric vehicles, as he uh, persuasively explained. Um, but electric vehicles are also an, one of many different uh, flexible load resources that can serve these functions. So it's part of a broader agenda uh, for, for a flexible and clean uh, electric regulatory system. Uh, building codes is another important item to enable uh, low-cost installation of charging stations in the long term. Uh, and we also care deeply about equity and low-income access. Uh, electric buses certainly help clean the air in disadvantaged communities uh, who are disproportionately affected by, by local air pollution from highways and, and local traffic. But we also want to ensure that low-income drivers aren't left behind on gas uh, because I think there could be some, some major injustices if uh, low-income in 20 years, everyone who can afford an EV has one, uh, only people who pay gas uh, prices are, are, are the less fortunate among us. Uh, there are also some important uh, issues uh, around equitable contributions to transportation funding and, and uh, the resources that the state spends in those areas. Uh, we want to find a way to get equitable contributions from EV drivers to transportation agencies and cap and invest for the transportation sector to help drive down emissions is another important agenda. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, important conversation. Thank you. Public speaker number 12. My name is Adam Filker, and uh, I'm a member of the Ridership Advisory uh, <coughs> Council here in Worcester for the WRTA. And uh, as, as you may know, every year there is a fight about operational expenses for the RTAs. We're fairly well set on the capital end of things, and for that reason, the faster that we can adopt electric buses system wide, the lower our operational expenses would be. In addition to cleaning the air, in other words, this would take some of the pressure off of the budget annually for the state by reducing the fuel costs for the RTAs in general. And that's the whole of my statement. Thank you. Can I add something? Yes. Thank you. You'll be happy to know that one of the 19 commissioners represents the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. And she, um, she's a great advocate for where you're coming from. Thank you. Probably said about what I said. <laughs> Not as eloquently as you said. Thank you. We'll now hear from public speaker number 14. gentleman's comment about environmental justice populations, um, make sure they're not unduly burdened with the cost of uh, electric vehicles to clean. Um, we try to do that with, um, I don't know if anybody from Bush's Regional Transfer Authority is here, but um, when we have the Bush Regional Transfer Authority buses go around, we make sure that all the routes kind of alternate between the electric vehicles and the and the uh, regular diesel buses, but even the range, it's not always possible to go to the farthest location with the buses. Um, the other thing is um, also because Booster WRT was the, the, the first adopter of the electric vehicle technology. Um, recently, when they had uh, buses that needed some maintenance, they had to send them back to Virginia, wherever the bus was manufactured, and it took them like three months. I, I don't know. I'm just a month or more for the buses to come back. So we need more trained um, personnel. So we're looking at kind of colleges, automated, te automated technology to um, the courses kind of incorporated as far as policy if you're looking into the future. Um, and also some kind of a policy in place to for charging. It's one thing to have buildings have the conduits ready for EV, but Again, it's free electricity for this building. Like right now, the charging stations are mostly free. 
you need to come up with a mechanism to have to charge people uh, when they're charging their vehicles at these public locations or um, somewhere along the road there. Thank you. We're now going to hear from public speaker 13. <laughs> no, I, I'm actually going to You're not going to say, okay. So public speaker 15. Hi, um, my name is Dave Wapner. I'm with Greenlaunch, and we are a uh, leading provider of electric vehicle charging software and solutions. We operate uh, a lot of charging stations across the U.S. and here in Massachusetts, particularly focused on, on uh, DC mass chargers. So I'll just offer three um, points of advice that we might have for you on the commission when it comes to charging. Uh, the, the first one would be that it's very important to have a robust network of public charging available, specifically DC fast charging um, in highway corridors where uh, drivers may have need for uh, quick charge while they travel long distances. Um, the second point we'd like to make is that um, interoperability is very important when it comes to charging networks. So you don't end up with stranded assets. Say you invest in a bunch of charging stations and then decide you want someone else to operate them, you could get stuck if you can't change your company. And, and the last point I'd like to make is to echo what Professor Brut said very eloquently, which is that utilities are a stakeholder in this conversation and one of the most important ones. And we would just like to make sure that we see utilities as an active and engaged member of this conversation. Um, and I, we'd love to commend the work that's already been happening in Massachusetts and the utilities work on to that front. And we're excited to see them be a uh, further participant. And I mean, just to comment on your question earlier about a jurisdiction that might be a good example for electric vehicles, uh, Norway has actually done a lot of work. They've got about 30% EV penetration um, through some great interesting policies around lanes and parking. So they might be something to look into, although it is international. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No? Public speaker number 16, please. Hi, I'll just uh, keep my remarks brief. My name is Matthew Porter, I'm with the U.S. Department of Transportation and Federal Motor Care Safety Administration. Um, and I don't want to monopolize a lot of the public time. But um, I would urge you, and I did hear it here, to think about fleets, in particular private fleets, talking about the Walmarts, the Amazons. A lot of those large private fleets are also thinking about going electric as well. And they're going to play a part in that picture in your time frames, 2020 to 2040. Um, going back to the infrastructure needs, I think you want to think about that in particular as well, because those large fleets have the ability to shift resources where they need, and so if there are electric infrastructures in other parts of the country but not here, they may prefer to use diesel vehicles here versus electric in other parts of the country. So I think you need to think about those infrastructure needs, particularly on your highways, but the short-range operations in particular may be thinking about going electric as well, so you want to think about those needs. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Number 16? Okay. Public speaker number 17, please. Uh, hello, thank you for holding the session. My name is Jack Spence. I volunteer with the Transportation Working Group that's associated with 350 Massachusetts, a climate change group. I wanted to make two brief points that I think have not been mentioned so far. One is related to the immediately previous speaker. One, another reason to rapidly adopt battery electric buses is that that technology may more rapidly advance the, uh, the adoption of the technology for long haul truck fleets. Second and rather unrelated point, uh, but another jurisdiction to consider is, uh, is uh, the Netherlands, uh, most famous for their mania for bicycles. Um, I read a statistic recently for 50% 50 of train travelers in the Netherlands arrive at the train station on a bicycle. But they also have, uh, regarding automobile transportation, they have a differentiated tax structure. So for sales taxes, as one example, gas guzzlers pay more, low emission vehicles pay less. Uh, they have, at, at least a year ago, they had a four tier sales tax structure. So that's another kind of policy thing that might be considered. Thank you. Could you just elaborate on your first point a little more? Well, I think in the case of bus technologies, there, are, there is an example of bus technologies advancing in a way 
that sped up the advancement of those same kind of better, tech, better cleaner technologies in long haul truck fleets. And uh, battery electric buses may have the same, if, if they are the leading uh, edge of this, they may have the same stimulus for long haul truck companies. Thank you. Can I, can I add to that? Yes, sure. So as we start thinking about uh, our carbon goals and decarbonizing, one of the largest challenges is, is figuring out how do we uh, deal with modes of transport that are rather large in nature, whether it is uh, flight or long, long haul uh, trucks. And the issue is really about um, how do you get uh, enough energy stored in a fairly small place so that you can move that much stuff around or that many people, um, th th that many people around. And, um, and, and the value of battery electric, battery electric buses today is that they're really at the forefront of technology and, and energy storage. And so when, when you encourage their, uh, their adoption and their improvement, then you're actually pushing the technological frontier and uh, of de decarbonization as a whole. Okay, public speaker number 18. Yes. Hi, my name is Earl Hartman, and I'm the director of an organization called Environmental Entrepreneurs. We go by the name E2. You can find us at www.e2.org. And I'm the director of the New England chapter of this nationwide organization. We are all business owners, professionals, uh, investors from a variety of different walks of life and, and work. And um, we support good environmental policy because it's also good for the economy. Um, here in Massachusetts, we have over 100 members. Um, so, um, I am dealing now with a, a personal issue that affects all of this. I have to cut my driving down because my vision is not that great. So I took public transit to Worcester last weekend. And while it was not a totally unpleasant experience, it did have its downsides. Um, it, uh, it took over an hour and a half and um, on the way home, when I got a ride, it was 45 minutes. Uh, the, the trains, I recognized from my youth growing up in Westchester County, they were exactly the same trains. So we obviously have a long way to go. And I want to, um, I want to uh, first I want to ask uh, people in the room, if you don't mind, how many of you came here via public transit today? There we go, we got three. Okay, that's something. That tells you something. It tells you that we do not have an adequate public transit system throughout the state that can get us from point to point. And so before we dig down into EVs and all the other good issues and important issues, we have to take a step back because we're talking about 20 years from now. And you are going to be talking about scenarios. And I think the biggest thing that I would offer is that we have you and we have the power to make a scenario come true by virtue of the policies we adopt. So it's not like just predicting how many EVs there'll be. How many EVs there will there be if we do X, Y, Z, et cetera, and the buses and the high-speed trains. Uh, I've traveled through Europe within the last five years, and in Spain, Italy, Scandinavian countries, they all have high-speed rail. And it's not, I would say, it's not by chance that we have become a society that is so dependent on automobiles. It's a result of multiple factors, two of which I think I'd highlight because I read a book about how um, the city of Los Angeles had a pretty good, darn good subway system. But General Motors came in and said, no, 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 you don't want that. Let's shut it down. We're all going to go to cars. Well, that's what happened. The other part was that we we uh, incentivize driving by building the interstate uh, highway system, which is a good thing. I'm glad we have it. But we made the future happen. And that's what I'm hoping that this commission will have in mind 
as you make your decisions. So, um, now we'll get down a little bit more granular. <laughs> I think our overall goal is to provide more affordable, reliable, convenient options for more people in terms of uh, how they can get from point to point. Um, we are behind the rest of the developed world in many ways. We're even behind China. Who, go figure. Um, <laughs> and um, so I think that what the driving forces are for EVs will be and can be policies that enforce low mileage standards, investment in the infrastructure, and especially for high speed charging infrastructure, um, and pricing so that uh, people in some way or another get a rebate or an incentive to move in that direction, including fleets, including buses. And I agree with the first speaker that buses are very, very important and likely frontier to be at the leading edge of this. I, I just read an article that pointed out all the benefits. The downside they pointed out was the upfront investment, but just as we figured out ways to handle that in solar, uh, when we put in solar panels, we can also figure that out so that people pay off the upfront cost over time based on the savings that they get. Um, and also, I think we need to do more than just build things. We have to educate, we have to uh, communicate, and we have to um, make EVs sexy. That's kind of what Tesla's done so well, and that's why they're considered um, a leader. Um, and then finally, I think specific policies that relate to autonomous vehicles. I think in 20 years, we're gonna have a lot of those. And we have a chance now, because we don't have, virtually, we have virtually none of them, none of them running around on our streets, to make policies that make the whole issue of uh, climate and, and carbon better. So I think at a minimum, we should require that all autonomous vehicles are uh, electric vehicles and hopefully zero uh, electric, zero emission vehicles. Uh, second of all, I think we should um, propose and, and somehow enforce a policy that some high percentage of these autonomous vehicles must be shared vehicles because they've got an, a, a great ability now, they've got all the technology to uh, find where people are and pick them up when they're ready. And um, uh, finally, I uh, just would say um, keep looking to the future in a way that um, means that you can shape that future, not just be a victim of whatever comes along. Thank you. Any follow-up questions? Um, so, so just one, one point of clarification. Yes. So the commission is not trying to predict the future because I think we'll all get it wrong inevitably, but it is about developing plausible scenarios and then making sure that we make appropriate investments based on that. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I believe it's speaker number 19. Uh, that right? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ed Young, and I work for Toyota Motor North America. I'm involved in hydrogen fueling station development in California and Massachusetts. Massachusetts has adopted a zero emissions vehicle requirement that enables automakers to provide innovative zero emissions drive trains to its citizens. The introduction of new technologies present daunting challenges for consumers and consumer adoption. The purchase of a new vehicle represents a significant investment of both money and time, not the most significant for some people. And the selection of a vehicle is intensely personal as consumers face uh, factor in branding, image, economics, in addition to utility, durability, and environmental benefits. For the ZEP mandate to succeed in the Commonwealth, zero emission vehicles have to live up to consumers' expectations and meet its owners' needs. Currently, two ZEP drivetrains are available to consumers, battery electric and fuel cell, fuel cell electric. Battery electric vehicles provide for the convenience of home charging. For certain folks, they may never have to utilize external fuel in order to have to go anywhere to, to charge or fill up the car. And that, that is a great advantage. Fuel cell electric vehicles have the benefit of longer driving ranges, faster fueling, and scalability. Folks that drive tens of thousands of miles per year might benefit 
from the longer driving range and faster fueling of fuel cell electric vehicles. To drive consumer adoption of ZEV in the Commonwealth, Toyota believes that Massachusetts should provide consumers with options. Toyota has been developing hydrogen fuel cell technologies for more than 25 years. We believe that fuel cell electric vehicles have the potential to beat drop the powertrain for the next 100 years. Toyota is committed to the global advancement of these innovative, efficient, zero emission vehicles. In 2014, Toyota successfully launched the Toyota Mirai in Japan, followed by an introduction in California and European markets. The Mirai is a mid-sized four-door sedan with an EPA-estimated range of 312 miles, refueling time of three to five minutes, and water vapor as its only, only emissions. From 2015 to 2018, California's hydrogen fueling infrastructure has grown from single digits to 35 retail stations, allowing for the sale of more than 3,500 Mirais, together with Honda's, Honda Clarity's fuel cell electric vehicle, Hyundai's Tucson fuel cell electric vehicle, and the Mercedes-Benz fuel cell electric vehicle. There are nearly 5,000 fuel cell electric vehicles on the road in California. Today, Toyota is now ready to expand the Mirai into markets in the Northeast. Fuel cell electric vehicles are well suited for consumers in Massachusetts, as fuel cell electric drivetrains perform well in a variety of climates. Fuel cell electric vehicles do not experience cold start, fueling, horsepower, or range issues as do other zero emission vehicles, vehicle options in the cold. In addition, fuel cell electric vehicles do not require substantial upgrades to the electrical or natural ga gas grids in isolated vehicles. The biggest challenge facing widespread fuel cell electric vehicle adoption is the lack of fueling infrastructure. The Northeast, given its ZEV requirements, is a priority region for Toyota. We have partnered with Air Liquide, an industrial gas company involved in hydrogen for the development of hydrogen fueling stations from Massachusetts to New York. Air Liquide has established a hydrogen distribution facility in Littleton, Massachusetts, and has completed the construction of four stations in the Northeast three of which are in the Greater Boston area. The next phase of Air Liquide Station rollout fills out the network and covers Lexington, Newton, and Braintree, in addition to other areas in the western suburbs. One of the key lessons learned during California's hydrogen infrastructure development and the launch of the Mirai is that the availability of multiple stations is critical to the stability of the hydrogen for the network. This stability and redundancy give consumers the confidence they need to adopt the new technology. To accelerate fuel cell vehicle deployment in Massachusetts, Toyota looks forward to working with the Commonwealth to quickly address barriers that include tunnel restrictions and, sta and station locations. Once a robust network of hydrogen stations are online, Toyota intends to launch the Mirai in the greater Boston area, uh, thus enabling the transition to fully electrified transport. We're pleased to be here today and look forward to launching the Mirai. Thank you. Any questions for speaker 19? Uh, the, the, of the commission. Uh, are you speaker 20? Yeah. No. Um, it isn't a dialogue, unfortunately. No, you could maybe ask a question after. Okay. Um, so public speaker number 20. And I would just remind folks if they could identify their name and their affiliation, that would be really helpful. So public speaker number 20. I'm sorry, I leave it all set. You're all set? Okay. Um, anyone else? Oh, public speaker number 21. Is there anyone else who signed up to testify who has not done so? Is there anyone who didn't sign up to testify but would like to do that now? No? Well, that concludes the public listening session. So again, I thank you all for coming. Um, this commission plans to conclude its work with a report to the governor on December 1st. So um, it's pretty ambitious. We have a lot of work ahead. We appreciate your input into all of this. Um, I believe that there are flyers with the dates for the additional listening sessions that you can get if you'd like to disseminate that to colleagues or to friends. Um, you also can get in touch via our website, which is future.of.transportation at state.ma.us. So again, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it.